Good. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the very first talk of EMF 2016, uh, which is Nicholas Tolvey talking about MicroPython. Um, with the talk, some of the, um, some of the schedules do overlap. So when we get to the point where the main talk's finished, if you do need to run to the next, uh, next stage to catch whatever's going on there, sort of, uh, he's not going to cry. <laughs> So anyway, with no further ado, I'll uh, introduce Nicholas, who's fellow of the micro, uh, sorry, not Microsoft, the Python, Python Software Foundation. And yeah, anyway, here, here you are, Nicholas. Okay, so, ah, good, you can hear me, I hope. So everybody on this side of the room, you're probably gonna enjoy the talk more if you're on that side of the room, because I'm gonna be doing, hopefully, some live coding and uh, demonstrations and things. And with the screen being over there for everybody to see, uh, I suggest you're over that side of the room. Then you'll be able to see what's going on. So my name is Nicholas Tolovey. I'm a freelance Python programmer. Um, and I'm here to tell you about MicroPython. Uh, what is it? What does it do? Um, why is it suddenly everywhere? So we better cover those questions, I guess. So what is it? Well. MicroPython is a re-implementation of Python 3, optimized for microcontrollers, small systems on a chip. What does it do? Well, it brings the power and beauty of the Python programming language to highly constrained computing environments. Um, so things like uh, the BBC Microbit, Arduino-shaped devices, and the EMF badge this year. And talking of that, why is it suddenly everywhere? Well, it's become popular in the last year or so because it facilitates simple yet rapid development on embedded devices. It has all the powerful features of Python that you would expect. Sometimes, depending on your device, uh, it might have more or less of the standard library that comes with Python. Um, importantly, it has a transferable skill set. So uh, I work in Python um, during the day, working, um, building large, uh, scalable websites, but I can use the skills that I know as a Python developer on uh, microcontrollers and embedded devices, um, which makes it rather a, a fun thing to do. Um, and also, this being Python and MicroPython, it has an outstanding community. So, that's it, really. Um, actually, um, as I mentioned, uh, MicroPython, it's all over EMF, because all the badges that you're going to get run uh, a build of MicroPython. Uh, MicroPython's actually all over the UK as well. Um, now, I can't see an awful lot because I've got lights in my eyes, but uh, could you put your hands up if you've heard of the BBC Microbit device? Okay, that's pretty much everybody, which is what I was expecting from EMF. Um, so, uh, you would be unsurprised then if I told you that a million of these devices have been delivered to the UK's year seven, so that's the year when you're turning from 11 to 12, um, and this was a partnership created by the BBC. One of the partners was the Python Software Foundation. Um, I'm a PSF fellow, and so I was the person who uh, helped organize um, for the PSF the, the collaboration with the BBC. And all the work that I'm going to show you on the microbit uh, today for, the, uh, for MicroPython has been done by volunteers here in the UK and around the world. Okay, so nobody's paid people to do this. So. Um, you could also use um, software from one of our other partners, so Microsoft, if you go to their tent, they have some, um, so an alternative programming environment that you could use on the microbit as well. Um, micro <laughs> MicroPython is all over the world. So uh, Damien George, the creator of MicroPython, is Australian, uh, and he ran a successful Kickstarter, which I'll talk about uh, uh, later on. Uh, but the Pi Board, he tells me that he gets fan mail from children in Saudi Arabia who are using the Pi Board and MicroPython in their, uh, in their lessons uh, in the US. It's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and, and this is the thing that I, uh, I really like, because uh, uh, I'm a bit of a space nut, is that MicroPython is going into space. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that as well soon. Um, but I think that's really cool, is that I could be writing in a language that I could use to program satellites in a few years' time if this project comes to, co comes to fruition. So uh, this dapper-looking chap is Damien George. He's a physicist who was, until two weeks ago, based in Cambridge here in the UK. Um, and uh, for a bit of fun, he created MicroPython. Why wouldn't you want to re-implement Python 3 in your spare time? But that's what he did, and it's become this hugely successful project. Um, so, how does MicroPython work? So, I'm not going to give 
a very technical explanation of this uh, because um, you can find out the technical details online. Um, but uh, this diagram essentially shows you the flow of what MicroPython is doing. Uh, if you start at the red boxes on the left-hand side, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it that well, but it says REPL prompt, user scripts, um, and compiled strings and things. Um, that essentially represents Python code, as we would see it in our editor. Um, that goes through several steps uh, to get to the compiler. So the Lexa will tokenize the uh, Python script. Uh, the tokens are then sent through the parser. So you get the parse tree, which is what the compiler uses to turn into um, uh, something that can be executed on the device. Um, now, for the micro bit, uh, we, have, um, we, we have a virtual machine. Um, so it's compiled to bytecode. Um, the bytecode is loaded into the virtual machine and it is executed on the device. And I believe that's the same for the uh, EMF badge. Um, so the, the virtual machine executes the bytecode and stuff happens. Um, you have native code as well. So um, MicroPython can compile to whatever um, uh, executable you might need for the particular device that you are uh, programming. And there's also something called Viper code, which I have absolutely no idea what it is, because I've never been involved in that part of the MicroPython project. But it sounds cool, called Viper. Anyway, that's how, <laughs> that's how, I actually, I know a little bit about what it is, but uh, ask me later. Uh, that's essentially how MicroPython works. It's a very, very simple system. Um, and the important thing that you need to know is if you're thinking, ah, right, okay, well, Nicholas hasn't really told me that much about it. I know what I'll do. I'll go to the micropython.org website, find where their GitHub repository, and see what I can find out about this code. Uh, some things that you need to know. Um, because MicroPython is designed to work in highly constrained uh, computing environments, uh, it does not follow traditional uh, software engineering practices that I might use um, when I'm writing great big uh, websites, for example, in Python. So uh, basically, Damien optimizes first. Um, he uses lots of creative solutions and tricks. Um, if he can, everything's about size, so everything has to be as small as it can. So clarity, which is something that developers, especially Python people, uh, like to trump as a, as a benefit of the language. Um, in the C code, the implementation of MicroPython, um, it, we're looking for smaller code. Um, smaller code, more smaller code. Uh, Goto is not discouraged in, uh, in the C code. Um, programmers will understand uh, that's rather a contentious issue, but in the case of MicroPython, it, it gives us uh, some efficiency here. Um, because we don't have a lot of RAM, um, everything's optimized for, uh, for, um, for not a lot of RAM, uh, minimize the stack usage. Um, and all the decisions that Damien makes about these optimizations that I've flung through with a wavy, hand wavy type of uh, description um, are based on analysis. Um, so he's looking for how, um, uh, he, he's using analysis to work out where he can make the best optimizations given the particular platform for which MicroPython is being built for. So here's Damien again, and he's always asked the same sorts of questions, which is, why do you do it this way rather than that way? Why do you do it this way rather than that way? Why are you doing go to rather than blah, 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 blah? Why blah, 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 blah? And essentially, it all boils down to one essential factor that Damien is uh, concerned about, and that is to minimize RAM usage, because we are working in a constrained environment. If you are interested, and I encourage you to, to have a look, because it's a very friendly community, um, go along to micropython.org. Uh, MicroPython supports lots of different devices, not just the uh, microbits or the Pi board or the EMF badge. There's lots of people doing crazy stuff with lots of interesting embedded devices. MicroPython.org is the place to go. Um, so why would you want to re-implement Python 3 for microcontrollers? So I asked Damien this a couple of days ago when I was exchanging emails with him. Uh, and he said, well, you know, because it was there really. Um, it was a fun thing to do, and he wanted to see whether he could do it. And so um, he's done it. Congratulations to Damien. And also, Damien loves writing in Python, and uh, he wanted to make it easy for people uh, to program using Python in such constrained environments. So this goes back to my point about having a skill set that's easily transferable. So how did MicroPython come into being? Well, Damien sat down and he figured out, well, could this work? After a, a spike of code, yes, it could. He put um, his proposal on Kickstarter, 
and uh, almost 2,000 backers pledged almost £100,000 uh, for him to complete the work. And they got a, a little pie board, um, which I don't have on me right now, a very small device which they could then use uh, to play around with MicroPython. Um, about nine months ago, Damien ran a second Kickstarter uh, for, uh, converting, um, for a conversion of MicroPython to run the ESP8266, which is a system on a chip um, for, with, that has built-in Wi-Fi. Um, and it works, which is wonderful. And he had uh, almost 1,400 uh, backers who pledged almost 30,000 pounds for this to, to happen. So Damien is working full-time on MicroPython uh, on this. And, um, and of course, there's the BBC Microbit. Um, so this is how I know Damien, because my involvement in MicroPython has been through the Microbit. Um, one day, we were sat in London having a cup of coffee, uh, wondering how we would describe to the BBC what our vision of MicroPython on the Microbit would be. And we literally uh, sketched it out on the back of the table mat and took an arty-farty photo of it, really. And that's what we showed them when we went into the meeting. But the important thing is that a million children um, and an international team of volunteers have been involved in, in the microbit. The million children obviously get these devices and they can learn to program with them. And the international team of volunteers, uh, many Pythonistas, many people who for the first time um, have started to work in an embedded environment like myself. Um, it's been an interesting sort of an adventure. And uh, they've been doing some crazy stuff. So uh, this is a robot built by a friend of mine called Radomir, who is a Polish chap based in Switzerland. Um, and he essentially, uh, well, by the looks of it, got some, uh, got some motors and nailed them together with a micro bit. And this is what the result was. <laughs> kind of cute in an all humans must die sort of, a, <laughs> sort of a way, really, isn't it? I think he does it again. Yeah, here we go. Very, very silly. The important thing is that about the micro bit is that uh, we want to inspire creativity. Um, and uh, with silly robots like this, um, we hope that kids, things that kids could make in their CDT class, remember, this is just some motors nailed to get, well, glued perhaps, together with a micro bit and some very, very simple Python. I think it's only about 15 or 16 lines of Python code that gets you to here. Okay? So, this is the bit that I've been working towards, um, which is the live demo. So, I believe tomorrow you get your badges. So here's a sneak peek. Yes, it works. Here we go. So Aha. So here's the badge. It's running MicroPython. And what I'm going to do is give you whoops, a very simple outline of what you need to do um, to get in touch with Python on this device so you can start hacking with it. Uh, so uh, you, first of all, plug it in, this, which is easier said than done when you're live on stage at EMF camp. There we go. And if I go to my REPL here, I should be able to, oh, that's interesting. I obviously didn't sacrifice enough chickens to the uh, demo god this morning. Let's see what I can see. Okay, so we have the board. I can do it this way. So when you plug in your, uh, your, uh, your badge, uh, it will be mounted as a flash uh, storage device, and there's nothing on there. Oh, man. There we go. And uh, what the device will do is it will attempt to look for uh, a file called main.py in the root directory here of the file system, and it will attempt to run whatever Python it finds in there. Um, now, the badge team here have told me, and another caveat here is that I only got this badge about two hours ago and have spent about 15 minutes playing with it. So. Um, there's live demos for you. Um, what it does, it actually runs um, a boot.py file, if it also finds it, and uh, the main file that it runs is going to be in home, 
uh, main.py, which is this beautiful piece of Python code. But what I can do, and this is without the aid of a safety net, is if I rename this to uh, main.py2, and I rename this to main.py, and then I unmount the device, and then I restart it, Fantastic. You'll be relieved to know it works. So I have created a very simple spirit level in MicroPython. Now, that's all well and good, but there is a REPL that you should be able to connect to. Yeah. Hey, okay, so we have a REPL. So, uh, plug your device in, use screen or something to connect to it. I have no idea what you have to do if you're on Windows, but anyway, um, here we are. Uh, this is Python, so I can see what's in my scope. Uh, there's even help built in. Just like regular Python, I can print, hello world. There we go. It's just regular Python. So please have a poke around. Um, you can live code the device as well. So there are several uh, libraries for the, um, for the screen that lets you draw all sorts of interesting things on them. Um, so I would use the REPL to experiment and work out how it works, put it into a script, and then see what happens. OK? Back to the presentation. So that's the badge that you're going to get. The thing that I've been involved with is the micro bit. This is the micro bit. How many of you actually seen one and held it and caressed it? Oh, okay, there's about, I don't know, a third of you. Okay, so let me tell you what a micro bit does. It runs MicroPython, obviously. Uh, on the front, there are two buttons, button A and B, and there's a five by five LED matrix that, uh, that scrolls bright red, uh, information across it, should you make it do so. Across the bottom are uh, GPIO pins, some of which are big enough for you to attach crocodile clips. So it's very makey-makey, as it were. On the back, uh, the, the parts are labeled. So we have, uh, over here is a, a power um, socket. Um, we have a reset button here, a micro USB connector here. Here is an antenna uh, for BLE-related things. And uh, we have the ARM chip is here and an accelerometer and a compass as well. So there's rather an awful lot on the device, okay? So as part of the project to work with the BBC, uh, they asked us to create a web-based uh, editor which fits in with the microbit.co.uk website. Um, one of the things that we did in the autumn uh, after we created this editor is we, or well, I went around the country and spoke at various teach meets and Python user groups um, and uh, demoed this to get feedback from teachers because it's the teachers who are going to be um, providing uh, the, the support for the device. And the feedback we got was that actually they preferred using uh, a real editor rather than using a browser-based editor. So. Uh, over the Christmas holidays, basically, uh, we wrote um, a native app which we call Mew. Here it is. One of the features that teachers said was, you know what, when you're giving presentations, the people at the back can never see what it is that you're coding. So we would like zoom in and zoom out buttons. So I can demonstrate this feature for you now here. It's, it's awesome, look. Okay. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Unlike the other sorts of platforms where you have to do it through a browser, you have to download a hex file, you have to drag the hex file over to the mounted file system, it flashes, blah, 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 blah. Because this is a native app, we can do all sorts of interesting things. Like if um, I uh, want to flash this very, very simple piece of Python uh, that, that all it does, let me zoom, whoa, wrong zoom button. All it does is zoom, is um, zoom, scroll, hello world, across the screen. Uh, I just click the flash button and it should scroll, hello world. Let's see what happens. Flashing the device still. Here we go, hello world, woo, it works. Just fancy that. <laughs> okay, 
that's not all it can do. For example, uh, we've built in animation too, so let me flash this. What we have endeavored to do with the APIs that we have created, there we go, it's a little clock or a radar or something like that, is make it as simple and as easy as possible for kids who are using this device to get to something usable. So this is, in essence, apart from the import, uh, a single line of Python. Uh, and it's rather easy to read. Show on the display um, the, uh, all the clocks in the image library. Um, delay for 100 milliseconds between each of the frames. And I want you to keep looping that um, forever and ever and ever. And so we get our little radar. Something a bit more complicated here. We've built in a whole bunch of images. Kids can create their own images. It's very simple to do with Python. Um, but I put the device in an infinite loop. Um, and I'm going to make this thing sparkle and react to button presses and things. So uh, the sparkling happens here. Um, if button A was pressed, show a random image. If button B was pressed, scroll hello world. And if the accelerometer uh, had a shake gesture, just show an angry micro bit, okay? So let's see if this works. Live coding demos, aren't they great? So, it's sparkling, and if I press button A, sorry, button B, we get hello world. And if I press button A, there it is, going back sparkling, we get a picture of a rabbit that disappears into the sparkles, an umbrella, or sunshade, depending on what the weather's doing, a heart, all done at random, a skull, and if I shake it, urgh, you get an angry micro bit. Arr, there it is. Pissed off micro bit. There we go. If you remember, I said that you could get to the REPL on the, um, on the EMF badge. Well, you can do the same thing here. Um, let me zoom in a bit. Let me not do that. Excuse me. REPL, zoom in. There we go. So uh, what you can see here, what you will see here, live demos. Here we go. This is uh, MicroPython running on a micro bit. And I used to be a music teacher. So uh, one of the things that uh, we've implemented is a uh, music module. Um, and I have a speaker here. And if I plug it in, it should just work. <laughs> That's what they always say. On, turn the volume up, there we go. Right then, so I can do something like this. Music.play, this is rather obvious. We want kids to be able to, uh, to discover this sort of stuff and, and understand how the API uh, works. So we want to play music. What do you use? You use music.play. Music.tabcompletion, hmm. It's got some built-in tunes, which I'll use for demonstration purposes. So somebody shout out a tune from the list there. Birthday. Yeah. What's that going to be? It's going to be like being in WH Smith with all those cards that you open and close. Let's see. Fantastic. Look at that. And <laughs> And uh, I can also make it do other interesting things. Music.pitch. So I used to be a musician. 440 is the uh, standard for uh, concert A that the oboe player will give when an orchestra tunes. Um, I want it to play for uh, one second. There we go. And now what I can do is some interesting stuff. For example, putting it into a loop. And I can say music.pitch. Pitch takes an integer. Where can I get these integers from? Well, how about accelerometer.getx? And then wait for 20 milliseconds, and let's see what happens. OK. Strangled cat. Or instant musical instrument. So imagine. Imagine a room full of 11-year-old children on a Friday afternoon and it's raining and the teacher brings this out. It's going to be chaos and mayhem, but they're going to have a lovely time. 
<laughs> so I'm going to reset things a little bit now, and hopefully um, I can make this work properly. Okay. Like I said, not enough chickens for the demo gods. Oh well, I've lost the REPL. Anyway, what we've done is we've built in a speech synthesizer. Um, I found some, uh, a Commodore 64-based um, speech synthesizer, and uh, it was written in C, and so we've made it work. And maybe the REPL's there. Yes, it is. So I can do something like this. I can, let's zoom in so you can see what I'm doing. I import speech, everyone see that? Speech, whoops, why is it you can never spell or type when you're doing a demo? Speech.say, again, very, very obvious, L-O-E-M-F. I have no idea if this will work. Can you imagine the fun the kids are going to have with this, with MicroPython? So, let me flash this onto the device. Uh, and essentially, it's a recreation of uh, the sound of music. We're going to get it singing, I hope, if it works. Singing microbits. It's sort of like the Daleks' greatest hits, really. <laughs> so the other thing that I mentioned is that it had an antenna. So you can have inter-device communication going on. I just happen, in Blue Peter fashion, to have one I prepared earlier. Um, yeah, this is it. Second microbit with a battery pack. And it's been programmed with the script that you see in front of you now. It's very simple. I import the radio module. I switch the radio on. I clear the display. I put it into an infinite loop. And if it receives a message, and the message is hello, it displays a happy face. Okay? That code that I've just described to you um, almost reads, I guess, like English. Okay? This device, however, I'm going to flash with radio hello. Again, I import the radio module. I switch the radio on, while true, if button A was pressed, send the hello signal, okay? And if everything lines up, <laughs> this little fella should show a happy face. It's still flashing for me onto the device. Okay, let's see. Three, two, one. Hey, it works. Okay, so. Um, you can send arbitrary messages over the radio. Uh, the important thing is that kids, again, we've tried to create a very simple API. Kids are going to be inspired by this. So back to my talk. That was the live demo. Phew, I made it, OK? So I only just got my uh, EMF badge about two hours ago. Um, and so all you saw was what I managed to figure out in about 15 minutes. Um, I hope you explore um, what the device can do, because it's a lot more powerful than the microbit. Um, if you're interested in the hardware that went into the badge, uh, there is a link there. For the software, there's a GitHub repo as well. Uh, again, on the slides there. MicroPython documentation is docs.micropython.org, and forum.micropython.org is where you should be asking questions as well. Please experiment and play. Okay? Um, what about the future for MicroPython? Well, Damien tells me he wants to improve the existing offering. So there's an awful lot of work going on for tutorials and new websites and things like that so that, uh, so that MicroPython uh, actually starts to look more professional and so on. Not that it's not professional at the moment. Um, you can actually use MicroPython on a real operating system. So MicroPython runs on the bare metal at the moment, um, but there's no reason why you can't use it um, in other situations where you have a constrained uh, computing environment, like um, perhaps in a, in a game or something like that. I don't know. You could program a block in Minecraft with, with, uh, with, with MicroPython, maybe. Um, 
It's, uh, it's fully buzzword compliant in that um, a lot of Internet of Things people have been uh, using MicroPython recently. Um, and Damien recently got an email that explained that uh, somebody who would have spent weeks doing such and such a thing managed to do this thing in just an afternoon thanks to MicroPython. So hopefully this is a bit of a game changer in terms of rapid application development <laughs> uh, for Internet of Things appliances. Um, so, like I said, you should be able to embed MicroPython within other software as well, like games um, and uh, places where you need scripting. And, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, Damien has been working with the European Space Agency on a satellite control layer uh, that's written in MicroPython. So, literally, you should be able to program satellites in Python. How cool is that? Um, and, uh, perhaps, one of the most important aspects of MicroPython is the legacy that it'll have. Uh, so this was me having a discussion with some friends of mine on Facebook um, last year, and they wanted to know why on earth is all this effort being put into, into programming education, um, and why is MicroPython involved in this? And I, I answered like this, and I'll read it out, doing a bit of a PowerPoint karaoke for you. Asking what sort of education and learning our community supports is how we decide what sort of community we become. For it is through education and learning that we engage with our future colleagues, friends, and supporters. If we want there to be an EMF camp in 10 years' time, we need to help the young programmers of today uh, learn to code and get into the making movement and all those other good things. Um, we have about five minutes left of this slot. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to take questions. I'd like you to put your hand up, and the gentleman over there with a microphone will run over and ask a question, and you can ask your question into the mic. We have about five minutes, and there's somebody at the back there, always at the back. Why are they always at the back? Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. The, um, the radio send, is that a serializable uh, Python object, or is it limited in what it can send and distribute? Okay, so um, you can send arbitrary bytes. So you could do repra, for example, um, uh, to um, serialize the object. You could do what you want. The point is, is that it's just bytes that's being sent over the air. Fantastic. I'm seeing thumbs up. Any more questions? If you want to go to see the next talk, don't feel free. Don't feel that you have to wait here for me to finish. I Good think job. we'll call it a day. Thank you very much. Thank you.